Academy operates 10 campuses across Southern Ontario, and we are here tonight to answer some, you know, pre-set out questions from the Our Kids organization about private schools and, and what parents should know or should want to know. We'll also be opening up to um, individual parents and or prospective student questions towards the end of our session. We are set to be here for an hour, running from six to seven. Like I said earlier, we do have some pre, um, pre-constructed questions that I will go through with our panelists, but please be thinking of specific individualized questions you would like to ask at the end. I'm gonna briefly introduce everybody. We're gonna have a 40 minute session for questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up with, um, like I said, audience questions at that time. So this evening we have uh, Virginia Woodall, who is our admissions director, one of our managers of admissions at Blythe Academy. Um, she works with all of our 10 campuses and helps to field different interests as well as admissions and marketing materials for each campus. My name is Jennifer Kwong. I am our regional principal. So I oversee a few of our campuses, mostly on the west side of Toronto, but I work really closely with all of our principals on maintaining cohesive instruction and programming across the 10 campuses. Uh, we have Carol as well. Carol is a parent of our Lawrence Park campus. She has a son in grade 12 who joined our Lawrence Park campus in grade 10 um, after spending a year in public school in grade 9. And we are also joined with David. Um, David is a parent of the Mississauga campus. His son is also in grade 12 um, who joined the Mississauga campus in grade 11. Um, after spending a couple of years at other schools. So both with a wealth of knowledge, both um, able to speak to two of our campuses um, and both can speak to the differing experiences they've had um, and how Blythe can compare uh, to programming that's been received over the last little while. Um, so we'll start with questions. I'll address the questions. Um, like, so Carol, we'll start with you for the first question. Um, and we'll get, we're going to ask for about a two to three minute response. And then David, you can follow up after Carol's response um, with your own two or three minute response. And then, you know, we'll go down to the next question. This is a, a panel, not a debate. I'm just kidding. I feel like, you know, it can't be any worse than the other debates you've been watching on TV. So I set, I set to do a better job. Awesome. So again, welcome everybody and we'll get, uh, we'll get started. So our first question uh, for current parents is, why did you choose the school originally? And in which ways is the school what you expected? And in which ways is it not what you expected? So Carol, we'll start with you. Uh, so we chose uh, Blythe Academy um, after my son had moved from a uh, private school environment into the public school system, our feeder school for grade nine in Leaside. And, um, and my son has ADHD and is socially anxious. And we thought we'd give it a shot in regards to having him in bigger class sizes and, you know, being a part of the community in the neighborhood. It failed miserably. Um, he was extremely anxious. Um, he did not have the, um, he, he very much got caught up in a bad social environment. Um, he, he just, he just couldn't manage it. And unfortunately with the number of class, um, kids in each class, uh, he did not want to put up his hand and ask questions. He was afraid that someone would make fun of him. Um, he got behind in school. Um, the teachers tried their best to keep on top of it with me and with him, but it just really did not work out well. And, um, it, and his self-confidence suffered because of it. And thankfully he did end up passing the year, but it was, it was not good. So we chose to look at other alternatives, um, Blythe Academy. Had we known about Blythe Academy in grade nine, we would have definitely sent him there. Um, but needless to say, we found out in grade 10, um, when we met with the principal at Lawrence Park, Luke Coles, um, he was incredibly welcoming and it was, it, it has been an unbelievable um, experience and change for Jamie that um, we're really happy we made that decision. Thank you, Carol. Over to you, David. So I can repeat the question. Um, why did you choose the school originally? And how has the school met your expectations? And how has the school um, maybe not? What was something that did not meet your expectations? Well, uh, let me start by saying that um, I also have a daughter there. I forgot about Nadia. So. Oh, I did. I forgot about her. She just joined this year. Yeah, that's right. 
uh, she's in grade uh, 10. And so, um, so originally uh, with my son, it's two different sort of scenarios, but with my son, you know, he was, uh, he came out of a private school uh, up to grade eight, uh, a private school environment. And, um, and then we tried him in the, the public school system here, a good, good public school here. But uh, we just found that the um, there was just a, a little bit of disengagement. He had come from an environment where the teachers were very engaged, and then uh, in the public school system in grade nine and ten, we found that the teachers not not that they were disengaged, but they're just I guess there's just the volume of, of kids and uh, that they have to uh, attend to. Uh, just uh, I, we felt that he just sort of got lost. Uh, and lost his uh, way as far as learning is concerned and the importance of learning. And, and I think a lot of it had to do with um, the, the teachers. So we, you know, we, our original, you know, our original thought was that with uh, smaller class sizes uh, that, you know, he would be, you know, a little bit more attention and a little bit more, um, you know, focused. And uh, so that has proved out very well. Uh, and, uh, and then, so uh, with Nadia, with uh, with my daughter, um, a very different experience. Um, we just felt that uh, with COVID and the way that the public system sort of fell apart last uh, March, uh, we just didn't want her to go through another year like that. Um, it seemed like uh, as we were heading into you know July and August in the summertime, uh, it just felt like they weren't organized and they didn't really have a, a strong plan. So. Uh, and we had great success and, and uh, you know, very much uh, appreciated the, the experience that, uh, that Ryan was uh, going through with Blythe. So we, we moved our daughter over as well. Now, um, so what it is not is, um, you know, without the sports programs and what have you, it's, it's you know, there's a lot of focus on ac academia there and we think that's been that's been pretty good um, as far as my son is concerned. Uh, my daughter, uh, with respect to her, I would say that, um, to be honest, and, and Jennifer knows this, uh, she she didn't want to leave the public school system. She was, you know, in that critical age, uh, you know, girls, teenage girls. She thought she was going to lose all her friends, and there was a you know big drama in that respect. And uh, but as uh, as the weeks have gone on, the switch is, uh, transition has happened. Uh, it's been almost uh, amusing that you know, every day I say, how's it going? In the first couple couple days, she'd say, it's not, not bad, not, not too bad. And then now it's, now it's turned into really good and now it's great. And so it's taken a couple of uh, weeks for her to kind of get through the transition, but uh, it's working out really well. And, and uh, you know, the school is really over delivered. And I think that um, if, you know, I'm, I might go over my two minutes, you can cut me off like, uh, like, <laughs> but, um, but I think that the big thing is, is that we thought that the sort of the, the, the smaller class size and the, the attention and not having, you know, not being able to sort of disappear in a class and, and, and having to be accountable uh, to the teachers. That was what we thought was, would happen. But what, there's another element to that, another level to that that we found is that the teachers really care, and with our children, when they respond to that, and they have, I found that they come home and they say their teachers really care about them and they want them to do well. Whereas I don't think I ever heard that from the public system, and so I think that that is sort of the the defining difference is that not only is it smaller class size, but teachers really care about every individual student and they want to see them do well and the kids pick up on that mm -hmm. they really respond to that and that's been the difference for me awesome thanks david that was a great answer um okay next question you might have it was a good segue i think maybe for for you david um well maybe we'll start with you on this one and then we'll go to carol um what is the biggest impact that the school has had on your child you know what, just, he's really uh, changed his attitude towards learning. Like, you know, before, you know, not, I mean, a lot of that has to do with maturation as well, but, but at, the, at the end of the day, he comes home and he, and he kind of shares what he's learned and he's, he's telling us how he's interacting with his teachers. And I think that 
he cares about learning now. Like he cares, like before he's always, he was always a smart kid and decent kid, as you guys know, but, but, you know, it has just flipped the switch as far as his interest in learning and, uh, and participating and being part of the class and part of the conversation. I think it's made a huge difference for him. Awesome. Thanks, David. And Carol, how about you with your son? What was the biggest impact you feel the school has had on him? Um, I just think that uh, the fact that they believe in him and that there is that um, more of an adult interaction, more of a focus from the teacher to student or the principal to student, that they're, no, they're not a number, they're a person. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Jamie, you know, goes into that school every day. He says hello to, you know, the principal, um, you know, the teachers, what have you. Now it's a little bit different. There's not as many people around, but um, he feels part of something. He feel, feels part of a community as opposed to, you know, walking into a big uh, public high school and he's just shuffled along with all the other students. And, you know, there's just, it's, it's a bit of an overwhelming and anxious environment. At least that's what it felt like for him as opposed to, him walking into Blythe Academy feeling like he's in someone's living room or, you know, kind of he feels like he's come home and he feels safe. And I think that that's the important part for me. He, ne he actually never felt safe going to school mm -hmm. is what we ended up finding out that whole grade nine year. Yeah. And he didn't want to feel that way, but he felt that way. And it was, it was horrible to go through. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say that uh, having that, um, interaction with his teachers, um, them caring about him, you know, I think it's allowed him to actually mature as well as an individual to be able to properly communicate with adults. Um, I think that's sometimes what's missing in the high school environment because there are just so many kids and the teachers, I love them dearly, but they do tend to talk at the kids as opposed to talking with the kids. And I think that that's something that Jamie has really enjoyed is the interaction with his teachers. I think that's a very important skill because it allows him not only to mature and have a voice, but, you know, he's going to be having to talk to his boss one day <laughs> and he's going to have to have those conversations. He's going to have to be able to carry himself. And so I'm really happy to see that he is so-called come out of his shell. He's a lot more confident um, as an individual and he's finding his voice and who he is as a person as each year progresses. So it's been really, really neat to watch. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. I think that's what everybody would want, right? We all know that learning can't happen if students don't feel safe. And I think any parent wants their student to be able to come into their own and discover who they are. So that's excellent to hear that Lauren Spark is doing such a great job. Mm -hmm. doing a good job too. I think all of our campuses do a good job of that because of that community sense and that community feel. Um, what does your child have to say about school? So Carol, we'll start with you on this one. What does Jamie have to say about school when he comes home at the end of the day? You know, he enjoys it. Um, for the most part, he's your typical teenage boy, you know, how's school? Fine. <laughs> um, you know, he's not coming in the door and jumping for joy. However, um, it's not necessarily about the environment. It's just simply because he's tired and, you know, he gets a snack or whatever he does, he comes in and then once, you know, things settle, then I start asking him sort of different questions and then things start to unfold from there. And um, so some of the neat things that I think Blythe introduces these kids to in part of their curriculum is I think is really cool. Like tomorrow he's doing this UN debate in his politics class and he's actually really excited about it and it's very interactive and he does very well at that sort of thing. And so we started talking about that tonight when he got home from, from uh, school. And then, you know, we start Googling things and then I start helping with things and, you know, giving him kind of some ideas, but he's interacting and he's interested and he's engaged. And that's the cool part about it. Awesome. So, um, I think that, you know, Jamie overall is very happy to be there and did recognize that this slide was essentially a lifesaver for him. You know, um, he was drowning before. Awesome. Thanks, so, um, you know, he appreciates that. No, that's awesome. Thank you. And David, how about you with your two? What do they say about school when they get home at the end of the day? 
Well, you know what? They just they're just more engaged. I mean, they 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 will talk about their school as opposed to you know previously you know it was <laughs> much of the same. How's it going? You know, okay, you know, and you didn't get much out of them. But you know, uh, you know the 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 types of the type of learning that they're doing. You know, my daughter's doing that um, that World War you know two uh, story about a family member of World War Two. I mean, it it it's sort of it, it not only is it is it you know, interesting to her, but she's learning a little bit about our family and how it relates to the history, you know, in her history class. So, um, you know, she's, like I said, you know, she went in uh, really resistant to uh, change. It wasn't because it was blight. It was just because she didn't want to leave her friends. And, uh, and you know, after, you know, for, so what are we into, like four or five weeks now, she's, she's loving it, you know. And there's a lot more people there that she knew uh, through the community than she thought. And so, you know, the Lindsay's and some of the other, the, you know, Rowan and, and what have you. So those are, those are people that she knows. And so it wasn't, you know, it was a pretty easy transition for her. So she's really enjoying it. Like she, she's, and she appreciates, she's, you know, smart enough to know that we're trying to do something for her as well, you know, to give her a little leg up. And um, so she appreciates that. So she's, she's all, all for it. My son, he's a convert from last year. He, he loves it. He loves, he's an old soul. So he loves talking to the teachers. Like he, he, he's probably befriended the teachers just as much as the students. And, uh, you know, the students are fine there and he's made some friends there, but, but he loves the interaction with the teachers. And so uh, you know, you see a big difference there with, with just his, uh, you know, his ability to just communicate and, you know, I've, you know, I'm a big believer in EQ. Uh, I think IQ is important and marks are important, of course, but I, I really believe in EQ as well. I think it's going to be the, the finding difference in, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And, and I think that, you know, this gives them an opportunity to develop EQ with adults, with teachers. Whereas they, they, the teachers, again, as Carol said, you know, they just don't have time in the public system to, to engage and really get to know the kids. They've got so many, so many kids, uh, you know, at their... Uh, Know, under their wing so it's really been you know in that respect it's been really really good for ryan so they, they love it the both of them love it and they both were resistant they didn't want to leave public school but they they do love it so awesome thanks um so moving on to our next question if the school were to be represented as a single person what would its personality be like <laughs> you can only use three words this is like one of my admissions interview questions. <laughs> Tough one. Carol, are you going first? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. That's my job. Um, yeah, Carol, why don't you go first? Um, well, I would say this person, um, if I can describe it, this person this way, they're safe, they're confident, and they're mature. And I just, I think that that to me is what's representative of the sense I get from that school you know, and, and what it represents to my son and, and his experience and how I feel about it. Awesome. Thanks. Those are great adjectives. David? Um, caring. Uh, caring, I think, is a big one. I would say um, flexible. You guys have always uh, shown complete flexibility as far as, you know, how you work around different needs of the, the, the kids. And uh, extremely effective. I know that's two words, but, you know, um, put a hyphen between the two. Um, yeah, really effective. Like just, you know, you guys hit the mark consistently you know, all the time. Awesome. Thanks. I like all of those words. We should add them to our websites. Okay. A couple more just generic questions. So parents that are joining us, if you want to start thinking of individual questions, we have just three more kind of parent questions to go over. And then we'd be more than happy to welcome any of your personal questions. You can put those questions in the chat box for me to read out loud. So I'll be the only one that knows who asked those questions. Um, so it'll be anonymous in that sense. Um, but if you want to start thinking about that, that would be great. Um, moving on, David, you're in the hot seat first this time. How would you describe the values of the school and the values of the families within the community of the school? That's a tough one. Uh, it's not a tough one. I mean, um, caring, you know, like, I think that's, a, that's the difference. Like, it, you know, I think, 
right from the very beginning, Jennifer, you know, when, when I first called up and, you know, rarely do you get the chance to talk to the principal or, or you know, the, all the folks that are involved in the, the um, uh, you know, the, the counseling and what have you. And, and you know, right from the, the, you know, right from the start, when we, we started to entertain the thought of, of getting Ryan involved, um, you know, it was, you know, it was you and Jennifer and you, were, you started it and we went from there and it's always been this, uh, you know, this, this sense of caring that you really care about the kids and you care about the outcome and you care about the process, you care about everything. So, um, you know, and I think that the families that go there, uh, you know, I can't speak for other families, but I think they, they just want to ensure that their, you know, the children are getting the best opportunity they can you know, to, uh, to succeed. And I think that caring is, is to me, that's the, the differential uh, you know, aspect of this whole thing is that the teachers care. And when the teachers care, the kids care. Yeah. Yeah. I, think so. I mean, you know, we can, as parents, you know, pound in, you know, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. But if, if they feel like there's a disconnect at school or that there's, you know, that the, 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 the whole sort of system doesn't care about what, what the outcome is, uh, then it's hard for, it, it's just a little more, you know, uphill battle for the parents. And then I think that you guys, you guys, by caring, you take the pressure off us to have to try to motivate and, and you know, dictate that they do their work and what have you, so. Awesome, thanks. All right, Carol? Can you just repeat the question? Sorry, Jennifer. Sure, I can, one second. What would you, or sorry, how would you describe the values of the school and the values of the families within the school community? Um, I would say for the school itself, definitely there's um, a huge level of respect. Um, you know, there's obviously school rules that need to be followed and um, they are very well represented and very well explained. Um, and I think that there is a, there's a mutual respect that tends to come from that between the school and the students. Um, to David's point about personality traits, there is a level of flexibility, which I do think is key as well um, in allowing these students to recognize that, you know, they're not necessarily painted in a box. You know, everybody's relative, is somewhat unique in some of the needs that they have or some of the, um, you know, things that they bring to the table, but I think that the school in general tends to be, um, you know, they, they tend to be very respectful of, of the students and, but also, you know, they're, they're fair, but they're firm mm -hmm. um, in regards to how they manage things. For the, for the parent body, um, I don't know a lot of the parents in all fairness, um, but for the few that I have met through my son, they seem to have a very similar sort of um, attitude and their child is usually in a, a similar situation to what my son has been in where socially anxious, um, gentle souls, usually highly intelligent, um, but just couldn't manage the overwhelming sort of um, feeling in, in a bigger high school. So I think that they tend to sort of have a, a very similar um, purpose that they just wanna see their child succeed. Awesome, thanks, that's great. Um, okay, two more to go. So second to last question, Carol, we'll start with you this time. Um, what, to the best of your knowledge, do you believe differentiates Blythe from the other schools out there? I think that for me, I just found, because Jamie has been in a number of other private schools. So I had some sort of something to compare to as well in regards to, and then in the public school system. So I just, I find Blythe, it's a partnership. And I didn't necessarily feel that in some of Jamie's other schools. They were not bad. They met the, the, his needs at that time in his life. But I just, I feel a little bit like some of these other private schools dictate to you the way it's supposed to be, as opposed to working with your child and their unique needs to um, come together as a, in a partnership to meet those needs, to ensure that your child gets what, they're, what they need to ensure that yes, the rules are being followed and so on, but that um, if something isn't working, they're open to discussion. It's never that feeling of, 
your child didn't meet the needs of the school, so they're out. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's, it's never that trying to fit a square peg into a round hole kind of feeling that I felt in the past. And, um, and so, you know, from that perspective, I think there's a lot of freedom to, uh, to grow and to allow these students to grow based on what their unique abilities are. Great. Thanks, Carol. David? Um, so I'll repeat that for you. What, to the best of your knowledge, um, most differentiates Blythe from other schools? Well, I think uh, there's a couple things. The class size is the caring that I've already mentioned. Um, the focus on, um, you know, on academics, there's, there's not a lot of distractions there. I think the other thing is, is that, you know, most of the, you know, I'm, I don't know all the, the kids that are in my, my, you know, my children's classes, but I'm assuming that most of them come there, certainly in the later grades, um, you know, to uh, get ready for university and start to prep for university. And I think the, you know, although small classes are sort of contrary to the university, I think the, the focus on getting everybody through university, you know, I, with Alex and yourself, Jennifer, and, and you know, I get, I get so many emails. There's just so, you guys are so interactive with the parents. It's incredible. And, and one of the things that I really like is um, the assignment tracking and the mark tracking online. Um, as a parent, I'm, I'm a little less connected than my wife is, to be honest, but uh, she loves to be able to go in and see, you know, how much you know, what, what marks they got on what assignments and when they're due and your, your online system is amazing for parents um, to, keep, to keep track of what's going on in the kids' classes because, you know, I have a regular, you know, normal 17-year-old son who says, you know, did you do your homework? Yeah, it's done. You know, did yeah. you get your marks back? Yeah, I got it back. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I get the, you know, I get the 17-year-old treatment and, and, but this system that you have online is, 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 is amazing for parents. You know, we know assignments when they're due. Uh, so if we do want to get involved and, and try to, you know, be interactive that, then, then there's that opportunity to do so. The marks are all there. You lay out what the marks, how, how, how they're going to get their marks. So it's, uh, yeah, it's extremely helpful as a parent to keep track if, if, that's, if that's what you want to do. So. Awesome. Thanks. And can yeah. I just add one thing, Jennifer? Sorry. Sure, of course. I just I have this um, experience right now with my son who's taking advanced functions, and so I just recently my son's also got a tutor because he does find this very difficult. Um, but his math teacher has actually been in touch with his math tutor. They're working together collaboratively so that whatever is um, being done in class and taught and so on um, that. Jamie, the support system that Jamie has with the math tutor separately, um, that that gap is filled. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that that's really great um, how they, how we can work together with them to uh, ensure that, you know, there's success and yeah. understanding. No, that's, that's an excellent point. We do, we do like to tote our communication as something that we do really well. Um, and also um, those partnerships that you've touched on, right? We do, we do tend to hire teachers whose primary goal is allowing kids to meet their expectations. And I might be an amazing math teacher. I just might not be the best one to get it through your son. That's but right. me working with someone else has nothing to do with my abilities. It's really a, a bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we do try to attach to that bigger picture of student success as the primary focus. So that's excellent. I'm glad that's being your experience. All right, our last generic question. And then so far I've got four from the chat that I've been able to get, plus a really nice comment. So that's cool. Um, so the last question we have is um, what, so I, I'm gonna kind of like make my own question here and I'm gonna spin it off of the one they gave me, but what would families find most surprising about the school? And if you were to tell these families in the audience today one thing they should really know uh, about making their decision, um, what would that be? So Carol, let's start with you. I think the, the most surprising thing is, is that just because they're relatively small schools overall um, does not mean that they don't have all of the elements to sort of what a bigger school would have. For example, they've got all these teams that they set up. It's unbelievable 
the, the number of teams that are set up on a term by term basis. My, my son was on the basketball team last year, thoroughly enjoyed it. It can't happen this year, unfortunately, um, in the same way, but he thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, there's all these different clubs that are set up, uh, different teachers, you know, take time out to ensure that, you know, they, they do these clubs. And of course the interactivity with the students is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it, it is shocking to me. I have to say the number of teams, clubs, and outings that they do and they get them out of the school. And of course this is pre COVID, but they get them out of the school, you know, doing different things, you know, um, learning about Toronto, the city where we're located. Um, but they, they just, they're coming up with so many different ideas constantly to enhance their programming, um, which I am, I was nicely surprised about because I, I didn't expect that with, with the fact that the school is um, a smaller scale than say a crescent, for example. Um, so that was really cool. And I think they do a fantastic job. Awesome, thanks, Carol. All right, David, what was, what was something that you found most surprising? And then what's something you'd like to share with these families? You know what, um, surprising? Really no surprises other than it kind of over, over delivered um, as far as uh, my, my kid's acceptance of it. Like I'm, I'm surprised that the transition went as easy as it did, because both of them loved, they're both very social people. They loved the, you know, the, the numbers and the, the social aspect of a, of a large, you know, a high school, public high school. Um, you know, they, they loved all that. And um, they thought that, you know, this was gonna be um, a much different experience. And as it turns out, you know, they, after a couple of weeks, like I said earlier with my daughter, She's now giving me the, you know, it's, it's really good you know, versus, uh, you know, what I was expecting from her. And uh, so she's, uh, she's really um, embraced it. And uh, so that's probably the, the biggest surprise is that my, my kids acceptance in the transition. Um, you know, I thought there'd be a little more drama, to be honest, but uh, it, it hasn't, it hasn't occurred. And they've really enjoyed it. And I think it's just that warm, welcoming, caring, sort of atmosphere, you know, they're, they're young adults now, they're, they're smart enough to, to realize that people are trying really hard and caring about them and that, that you know, that, that's rubbing off on them and they're, they're appreciating it, so. Awesome. Uh, what was the other part of the question? I can't remember the other part. Well, is there anything else you'd like these families to know? No, no surprises, you know, it, uh, the only surprise is it, it, it worked out better than we thought, so. Oh, huh. yeah. that's a good surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I guess it is a surprise, but but uh, no, no negative surprises. So. Great, awesome. Um, so thank you guys so much. So now we have a couple of questions as well as some comments in the chat that I'll read through. Some of these questions are more um, probably appropriately answered by myself because as a parent, you guys might not know some of the answers to these. Um, first question was, what types of extracurriculars and clubs are offered? So. There are varying types of clubs and extracurriculars that are offered depending on which campus is located closest to you. So Lawrence Park and Mississauga are our largest campuses, so they tend to have a little bit more variety and diversity in the clubs and sports. Um, we're also the two campuses that are members of our local sports authority. So um, Mississauga is part of the Region of Peel School Sports Association, and Lawrence Park is part of the small schools Toronto Sports Association, which means we can compete in sports against other, um, like interscholastically against other students. Now, are we going to have a football team? No. Are we going to have a soccer team? Probably not. But we have housed basketball, we have housed curling, golf, swimming. Um, I'm trying to think what else we've done. Table tennis was a big one. Um, and really, the epitome of all of the Blaze campuses is that things are student driven. So if a student comes to us with an interest, I want to do this sport or I would like this club, then we look to facilitate that. Um, we also have multiple clubs um, in any of our campuses. Um, some run official clubs days, some do clubs before school or after school. Again, it's a little bit dependent on each school and the interests of the students. And as well as Carol mentioned earlier, we often get out into our community um, for different things, depending on what is, is in and around where our school is located. Again, this is all pre-COVID. 
Um, this year, there's really not a lot going on, but there's not a lot going on at any school. Um, so again, student driven, and it does vary, but there's tons. Um, there's also Blythe wide events um, where we compete against other Blythe schools, which include a triathlon, a three on three hockey tournament, a ball hockey tournament, a beach volleyball tournament, um, as well as part of our international organization of Globe Educate, where there was post COVID, hopefully there will be again, opportunities to compete internationally on things like arts, um, things like sports and things like academia. Um, yeah, so they just added arts there. Yeah, there's an art show. We do have an art showcase um, and there's international art competitions that we are part of. Um, campus to campus don't run, many campuses don't run very intricate art course offerings. Um, there's usually probably one or two art courses offered over the course of the year. But again, if a student had a dying interest in art, we would find a teacher to support that and look at developing something extracurricular for that student and maybe a few friends or other students that had similar interests. So hopefully that answered your questions. Um, the second was a more of a comment and then um, a campus uh, a question as well. So our teenager joined Blythe this year in grade eight at the Adamson Estate, so that's in Mississauga. Um, he's really enjoying the experience after a difficult year in the public system. Um, as we consider the move to upper campus, is there anything we should know that differentiates the Mississauga campus from the Etobicoke campus? So again, our campuses are run fundamentally on the same premise, same pillars, um, same values, same small classes. We hire the same kinds of teachers. We have the same types of communication expectations, same type of grade reporting expectations same experiential learning expectations. The differences are going to be in those community partnerships because each community is individualized, the location of the campus. Um, and then those student-centered and student-driven activities, like there'll be different clubs and different sports. Uh, Mississauga will have more sports offerings um, than Etobicoke just simply by pure number. Um, in Mississauga, when you get up to grade 11 and 12, you're looking at 60 to 80 kids per grade. Um, which is a little bit different than what you'll find at Etobicoke, but fundamentally um, very similar. The best thing to do is I would give it a little time for COVID to work its way out and then um, have them go spend a day at the other campus as well. Because like I said, we work together. We're a family that supports one another and we would want the student to find whatever fit was best for them. All right. Um, the next question was, what is the average size of a cohort, i.e. kids in a class or kids in grade nine? So again, changes slightly campus to campus. Um, this year I can speak to Mississauga because that's where I was, um, or am still mostly in Burlington. Um, so we try to, Mississauga right now has seven grade nines. This is the lowest number that we've really ever had. Um, I think there's just a lot of, I don't know, people seeing what was gonna happen. Um, that took place over the last year. And uh, usually we would hope to have two cohorts per grade. Um, again, it depends on size of campus and building, but our class sizes um, average out at around 11. So we don't run classes more than 16 um, or usually less than six, but our average class size would be around the 11 mark. So usually, you know, we'd, once you got to like 17, we would be splitting that class into two classes um, again. So we average out around 11. Um, the goal, of course, is to have, you know, more than one cohort per grade. Um, most of our campuses are um, top heavy in that our grade 12s is our biggest year, our grades 11 and grade 10 and then grade 9. It, it's like it, it takes a while for the good news to kind of trickle through all the peer groups and then more and more and more of their friends come. We obviously love to have the children longer because we have more time to develop amazing skills with them through our foundations program and through building of those relationships. Um, but we too tend to gain momentum in the later years, which is something um, we're, we're working really hard to entice people in for grade nine because you know we do such a good job. Just bring them along early. Um, next question is, what is the ratio of boys to girls? So. Um, most are 60-40, boys to girls. Some grades are different than others. We do tend to find that the nines and tens are heavier boy. Um, and then by the 11s and 12s, it almost averages out. And um, I'm not a scientist, um, but I, I am a mom of a teenage son and a teenage daughter. And I'm going to say that 
teenage sons tend to struggle a little bit more in that large, nobody has their thumb on you type of environment. So we kind of get them a little earlier. Um, and then I, I tend to see that we get the girls later on. Maybe they're just following all the really cool boys. Um, okay, and then the last question I have is, um, do you apply a specific campus or can a student be considered for more than one campus? So absolutely, you can consider more than one campus if you live in between both of us. Um, like I said, I work in Mississauga and Burlington and I work with Gloria at Topico too and at all the principals. Um, Oakville tends to be like the dividing ground between Mississauga and Burlington and we often, um, when we were allowed to do things like the day in the life experience where kids could come and spend a day at the campus, we would most often really highly recommend that they spend a day at each campus and um, see which one feels better because sometimes it's just a feeling and um, we're really all about that caring family community sense of feeling. Um, so. I would tell you to try out as many campuses as you like, and I'm sure you're going to find one of ours that you fall in love with. Um, okay, and then another question. Number of students, um, um, how, are, how are students with learning disabilities supported? And then I think someone else had asked earlier what, how many students with learning disabilities do we have? So again, it differentiates from campus to campus, and the type of learning need really dictates the type of support. So we do not have educational assistance at any of our campuses. So we, we don't take students that suffer from behavioral needs. We just, we aren't equipped to deal with behaviors. Um, but we are very well equipped to deal with lots of different learning, um, learning disabilities or diverse learning needs. So many of our students need extra time to complete tasks or um, access to oral assessment or a quiet space to take an exam or notes to be handed to them or one-on-one um, -on -one meetings in the afternoon to review material. Those are all things that we do pretty much for anyone because anyone should be able to ask for those things. Um, I would say if your child has specific learning needs that you're really curious about, I would reach out to the school um, and probably your first person you're gonna talk to is the principal and the second person is gonna be the guidance counselor. And between those two people, they will ask a bunch of questions, look at old IEPs, maybe read a psych ed if you have one. Um, and uh, they'll be really honest about what they can do. But the small class sizes and the relationship between the teacher and the student are two kind of ticks in the boxes that start you off um, on a good path. Um, I think I got all the questions. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, Carol, do you have any closing remarks? Um, I just want to say that with my son having ADHD, um, and, you know, quite possibly a few other learning disabilities in there that, um, that really haven't been quantified, but I would say that it is the best environment he has been in to learn um, yet in his whole school career. Um, anytime that he needs support from a teacher, he has it. He has extra time to do his testing, which generally speaking now he doesn't need, but he knows he has it. It takes the pressure off. Um, notes are provided on EDSB. Um, so EDSB is the system that um, David had made mention of the online system, which is absolutely fantastic. And so um, we can always sort of track sort of what's been done on a day by day basis, what they've learned, all of the notes are there, videos, whatever is needed. And then that can always be used as review but they know that they're there. So for example, with my son in regards to, we try very hard not to have him on the computer, like writing out his notes in class, because what happens is all of a sudden videos start to come up. So there's a huge distraction element there. So the teachers, they talk, they collaborate, they learn, they experience in class, and then the notes are given to them to review on EdSpy. So that is sort of the way at least um, they've, they've combated that issue with some of the distractions that can tend to happen in the in-class environment, especially with a child who has a learning disability and ADHD. So I found it, it's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And it's built my son's confidence because he's a smart kid. He just yeah. learns differently. Yeah, and um, that's usually the way it is. Very, very smart individuals just learn in a different way. Yep. Um, yeah, and on top of that, we often get that question, like, well, your classes are two hours and 15 minutes long and my child has ADHD. How are they possibly going to pay attention? 
for two hours and 15 minutes. And the, the quick answer is there's breaks, obviously. Um, but it, it's the engagement with the material that keeps them engaged and keeps them moving forward. Um, and because our, our classes move at a pace where there's something new being learned every day, there really is very, very few um, minutes of complacency where this is something we've already talked about. I can zone out now. I don't need to pay attention. Um, and, and the courses are developed intentionally that way. So um, we have quite a few students that have ADHD at all of our campuses, um, and they do really well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. David, do you have any closing remarks? No, I like the quad masters. I, I, I think that it keeps uh, pace to the, to the learning. I, I really think that, uh, you know, you can't fall behind. And uh, my son is grade 12. He's prepping for university. And, um, you know, he, he uh, you know, he's just, he's just so much more engaged and so much more accountable now. And he's very mindful of doing his homework and keeping up because he knows that, you know, with functions and, and some of the math courses that, you know, if you fall behind, then uh, you you know you can get yourself in trouble. So, he's been you know he's been you know, the, the 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 pace of the course I I, I kind of like. I think it's uh, more suitable to to Ryan. Uh, keeps him engaged, keeps him accountable. And the other thing is, you know, this still boils back down to the people. You know, and uh, you know I, I can't remember what I learned in grade five, but I can remember my grade five teacher, Mrs. Bell. You know, I'm 60 years old now, and I still remember how kind she was, and she made a lasting impression on me. And I know my son's gonna, you know, my son is going to, you know, probably recall some of the teachers that he's had over the last couple of years before he goes off to university. So, awesome. yeah. yeah, that was one thing we didn't really cover was our, our quad master system is a little bit different. Um, public schools are doing it now, um, but we've developed it and have been doing it for 10 years. So the approach of the instruction and the learning. In, in quad masters with us, it looks very different. So if you're experiencing a quad master now and you're thinking, oh, I don't wanna to go to Blythe because they always do quad masters and this isn't working for me, just let's, let's not really judge it by that. We do it very different. Um, and I, I would encourage you to, to try it anyways. Well, I, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. helps my kids. So. It's great preparation for university too because it's a similar pace to university. Um, and it allows students to do things with that information like Carol was talking about. You're just not memorizing and regurgitating. You're being asked to apply, to learn, to do, to model, to solve a problem. And that's really what takes information from your short-term memory, which you remembered long enough to fill in A, B, C, D, to, oh, I actually understand this and I can do something with it in my life. Um, so we're really proud of the, of the, the quadmaster system that we've developed over 10 years. And, and, and the pedagogy that our teachers use to, to teach properly within it. So that's great. Um, so I think that's all. I, am, I'm, I thank you all for coming. I thank David and Carol for volunteering to be part of this. Um, and I thank you parents for joining us this evening um, in our Zoom panel. And uh, we are really hoping that someday we can welcome you all into a campus for a tour. But until then, please feel free to reach out via email or phone or Zoom. Um, to any of us at any of the schools, including Virginia at admissions, and we'd be happy to answer any further questions that you think of once we log off, because that's when all the good questions come up is as soon as we say goodbye. Um, and uh, like I said, we're always here and uh, we'll continue to um, hopefully welcome some more new students. Awesome, Virginia, do you have anything else? No, just thank you uh, to you as well, Jennifer, for moderating our panel and uh, and guiding us through this evening. I'll put our email address uh, in here and I can get you in touch with the principal at the location closest to you uh, if you'd like to continue on the conversation from this evening. Sure, I've typed that incorrectly. So I've just put that in the chat there. Um, we'd be happy to, to schedule further calls and continue tonight's conversation. Awesome. Good luck, everyone. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Good Thanks, night, guys. David. <laughs> See you. Have a good one.